I had anticipated an early arrival at the lawyer's office, but upon my attorney's tardy appearance and our subsequent entry into the conference room, I found Mike and his female counsel already present. Witnessing their interaction stirred the familiar pang of jealousy within me, a reaction that invariably surfaced whenever I observed him with an attractive woman. Deep down, I couldn't shake the sense of inferiority I harbored towards him. At 48, Mike remained a captivating figure, more dashing now than in his youth, towering and robust, with a flourishing business of his own and leadership in the local chamber of commerce. The prospect of today's proceedings not ending favorably filled me with dread, as it meant potentially losing the solace of his embrace forever. Mike barely acknowledged my entrance as I followed my attorney into the room. I felt my complexion drain as Mike's elegant, fiery-haired attorney gently grasped his left forearm just above the wrist, a gesture of assurance that she stood by him. While slightly out of place in that professional setting, it wasn't entirely inappropriate. Officially, it was a display of client support and reassurance. Yet I couldn't help but interpret it as a signal of eagerness to conclude their professional relationship and explore a personal one. I knew all too well the pleasures she might anticipate if such a transition occurred. After all, Mike possessed both physical endowment and adeptness in its use, a fact I was intimately familiar with from years of experience. Mike's face lit up with his characteristic, warm grin as he turned to his attorney, but the expression quickly faded into neutrality before he glanced back at me. I felt an overwhelming urge to prostrate myself before him, to confess my shortcomings and beg for forgiveness, pledging to spend the remainder of our 28-year marriage doting on him endlessly. However, this wasn't the scenario I had envisioned. Frustrated by Mike's steadfast refusal to engage with me, I found myself compelled to arrange this meeting through my attorney. As my attorney engaged in conversation with the red-haired attorney, I settled into the chair opposite Mike. Retrieving the Manila folder from my oversized purse, I unfolded it and laid out my meticulously prepared two-page script. Catching Mike's faint smile, I was reminded of his familiarity with my penchant for thorough preparation, cultivated over our three decades of acquaintance. Mike proceeded to open his laptop, connecting a pair of small speakers and placing a sheet of paper and a pen beside it. Then, unsettlingly, he rested his hands on the table, his expression eerily blank, devoid of anger, hatred, grief, or any discernible emotion whatsoever. Having dedicated three days to meticulous preparation, I had committed my script to memory, leveraging my deep understanding of Michael Henderson to craft words that would resonate deeply with him. As the attorneys ceased their conversation, the female attorney took charge of the meeting. Well, we're all aware of the purpose of our gathering. Mrs. Jenny Henderson, the respondent, has agreed to sign the divorce petition under the condition that my client, Michael Henderson, listens to her for a minimum of one hour. If everyone is ready, I suggest we commence the hour now. With a twist of the dial, she set a small kitchen timer on the table, its loud ticking punctuating the room's silence. I couldn't shake my annoyance at Mike's insistence on involving his attorney in what should have been a private meeting. Despite my reservations, I was poised to bare my soul over the next 45 minutes, aiming to compel Mike to acknowledge his own faults, even if only partially justifying my own actions. The prospect of revealing such personal matters in the presence of strangers only amplified my discomfort. But dwelling on the negatives served no purpose. I had no choice but to proceed. Glancing at my now superfluous notes on the table, I recalled the advice of my friend Diana, who had used a similar approach to salvage her own marriage after infidelity. Their ego is wounded, she had advised. Begin by tending to that. Clearing my throat, I prepared to make my opening move. Thank you for meeting with me today, Mike. I want to start by acknowledging that I was wrong in my actions. None of what happened was your fault. It was entirely my own selfishness and lack of consideration. It took me some time to realize this, but I felt it was important to be honest with you from the outset. As I reflected on my behavior, I came to understand the depth of my mistakes. However, I also recognized that our dynamic might have played a role, albeit indirectly. I believe you want to forgive me, but perhaps you need a justification to do so. My intention in speaking openly about my faults is to provide you with that justification. 
If our children were still at home, I might have played the keeping the family together card, knowing it would likely resonate with you. But I wanted to approach this conversation with transparency and sincerity. Glancing at your reaction, I realize that you're meticulously noting down my words. Your expression remains neutral, and you haven't even looked at me directly. It seems you're processing what I'm saying, and I hope that my honesty will eventually lead to understanding and reconciliation between us. That nearly threw me off completely. My initial words mirrored his expectations precisely, which shook my confidence. In my arrogance, I had overlooked the fact that not only had I crafted my argument based on 30 years of knowing him, but he had spent those 30 years observing me as well. I admit, I was rattled, so much so that I stuck strictly to my prepared script. Um, as I mentioned, Mike, it was all my doing and the result of some foolish, self-centered choices I made. I felt adrift with the children gone and with age creeping up, feeling unattractive and useless when I encountered Jasper through my involvement in the church committee. He was subtle, a true master of persuasion. He knew precisely how to manipulate and when. He initially presented himself as a supportive friend, lending an ear to my troubles after church gatherings, especially during your frequent absences last year. Then, one day, we were unexpectedly ousted from the church right after a meeting. Jasper suggested we grab coffee, and foolishly, I agreed. It all seemed innocent enough. He portrayed himself as a caring confidant, and I failed to realize his adeptness at dismantling a woman's defenses. Well, from coffee shops, we progressed to restaurants where he lamented about his wife not understanding him. I know it's a tired cliché, but by then, I had placed my trust in him. The restaurants grew increasingly upscale, the gifts he bestowed upon me increasingly lavish. Oh, Mike, you can't imagine how flattering it is to have a man 15 years, my junior attempting to court me. You would have been proud, though. It was over four months ago when he propositioned me, and I refused. I realize I should have severed ties with him then, once his intentions became clear, but by that point, I had grown somewhat reliant on the boost his compliments and attention provided to my ego and confidence. I paused, sniffing at this juncture, wiping my eyes with the finger I had unwittingly rubbed against the piece of onion in my pocket. It stung terribly, rendering me hesitant to touch my other eye. With one eye watering profusely, I halted, then resumed, stumbling over my words as I hesitated. Oh my dear, I'm filled with shame for not ending things with him sooner. He took me to a fancy restaurant and splurged on a $300 bottle of Grange, even though he doesn't drink wine. Instead of letting it go to waste, I ended up consuming nearly all of it. I'm almost certain that was his plan all along. I was too tipsy to resist him by the time we left the restaurant. He offered to drive me home, and foolishly, I agreed. When we pulled into our driveway, he leaned in and kissed me, and I was too intoxicated to push him away. You know how I become after a drink or two. Then he began touching me, well, you know where. At that point, my reasoning was completely skewed, and all I could think about was getting him out of the driveway before the neighbors spotted us. That's why I suggested he park inside the garage. Admitting that I even considered the possibility of Jasper staying for a while in the car was a bit of a gamble. I understood the risks involved. I knew enough about men to understand that being cuckolded is a devastating blow to one's ego, and I wanted to assure you that no one else would ever find out about it. Well, except for the two lawyers, of course. Well, as the garage door was closing, Jasper stepped out of his car and resumed kissing me. As I mentioned, I had consumed most of a bottle of Grange and was in no state to resist. He took the lead, guiding me inside with my own key. I directed him to one of the spare bedrooms and, to my everlasting regret, allowed him to take advantage of me. I'm truly sorry, Mike. After Jasper, um, finished, I believe we both drifted off to sleep. I was intoxicated, and he must have been exhausted after pursuing me for four or five months. I want you to know that I wouldn't have consented if I weren't under the influence. I would have been horrified upon waking, and I would have immediately shown him the door. Then you walked in. When you switched on the lights and entered the room, I've never felt such overwhelming shame. The anguish on your face pierced me to the core. It was then that I realized the immense harm I had caused you and our relationship with one momentary lapse in judgment. 
tears still streaming from one eye, I turned to my husband with pleading eyes. After a lifetime of familiarity, I believed I could decipher his expression like an open book, gauging the success of my plea. Yet to my surprise, his countenance remained impassive. He didn't even glance in my direction. Instead, he busied himself with the laptop before him. I assumed he was taking notes until he evidently clicked on a link, and a voice emanated from the speakers. It was my voice. You, don't kiss me, your breath smells like beer, the recording said. Followed by Jasper's voice, what about you, with your great breath? What? I only had one glass of house white. The audio abruptly ceased, leaving an impressive silence in its wake. Or at least, that's what I think happened. The deafening roar in my mind drowned out any external sounds. Yes, I had felt embarrassed and humiliated when Mike discovered me with Jasper that night, preceding his swift retribution against Jasper's exposed form. But those feelings paled in comparison to the overwhelming shame of being caught in such a colossal lie. It completely shattered me. I had been so certain that my rehearsed script would suffice. My gaze darted around the room, landing momentarily on Mike's smug lawyer, whose faint smile barely concealed her satisfaction. I felt a pang of embarrassment as I glanced at my own expression. Meanwhile, Mike stared at me, his face devoid of any emotion, yet filled with expectation. In hindsight, I couldn't fathom why I failed to grasp the significance of the situation. It didn't occur to me to question why Mike possessed an audio recording of my encounter with Jasper that night. Why would he have a recorder unless he anticipated capturing something incriminating? What else had been captured on that tape? These thoughts eluded me in the moment, overshadowed by the sheer humiliation of being caught so effortlessly and without a hint of emotion. As the awkward silence stretched on, I found myself staring blankly at the cryptic shorthand of my notes. Foolishly, I pressed on with my prepared script, clinging to it desperately like a drowning man, clutching at debris in the ocean. It happened only once, it wouldn't have repeated, I swear. Please, believe me. I lacked the strength to resist him, but I... I wasn't so out of control that I didn't insist on protection or allow him to take advantage of our bed. He wanted to, you know, but I couldn't do that, no matter how intoxicated I was. You saw us, right? We were in Kelly's old room. Mike gazed at me with a mixture of sadness and detachment. His reaction was disheartening, whether it was his sorrowful expression or his lack of emotion. He shook his head and turned to his computer. I sensed rather than heard him clicking on an icon, and I winced until Jasper's voice echoed through the room. I can't help but admire you. You stir up so much emotion within me. As the recording ended, another double-click broke the silence. Once again, Jasper's voice filled the air. When can we replicate the thrill of being in your clueless husband's bed? It was incredible. This time, Mike swiftly terminated the clip and simply stared at me. His silence spoke volumes, laden with accusation. What could I possibly say? Every excuse I had made crumbled under the weight of my own words. The notion of it being a one-time drunken mistake, the claim of not betraying my husband in our own bed, all laid bare as falsehoods in just a few self-condemning sentences. Tick, tick, tick. I was rendered speechless. Despite the embarrassment coursing through me, I stole a glance at Mike, hoping for some indication of his thoughts. Yet his impassive gaze revealed nothing. In my peripheral vision, I noticed my lawyer checking his watch, a stark reminder of the ticking clock and the dwindling 60 minutes I had purchased in a futile attempt to salvage my marriage. So far, it was spiraling spectacularly out of control. I fought to suppress my rising panic. I'm sorry for deceiving you, Mike, about it being the first time, I mean, I began haltingly. I, I just couldn't bear to hurt you any more than I already had. I thought if I could convince you, it was a one-time occurrence, and for the reasons I gave, it would lessen the pain. My words trailed off into silence. Should I confess now, admit to seeing Jasper several times a week for over six months? The dilemma gnawed at me. I was uncertain of what Mike knew or didn't know. The recorded conversations revealed that the night he discovered Jasper and me wasn't our sole encounter, but to what extent was he aware? 
The fact that he had concealed a recording device where Jasper and I typically met hinted at suspicions of at least one other liaison. I was left in the dark. However, I knew one more lie would be my undoing. So it was time to tread carefully, stick to vague statements, and claim to the truth. The reality is Jasper successfully wooed me, though it wasn't immediate. He harbors a preference for older women, and it's undeniable that someone my age feels a surge of validation when pursued by a man nearly as old as her own children. I must confess, I lacked the strength to resist. I was vulnerable and needy. I contemplated fabricating the claim that I had only used the master bed once, solely on the initial occasion. While untrue, it would portray me in a more favorable light. However, I grappled with the uncertainty of how long Mike had been aware of my affair. Ultimately, I chose to maintain silence on the matter. Tick, tick, tick. I couldn't remain silent about all the issues plaguing us. Time was running short, and I urgently needed to rectify this disastrous situation. With no clear plan in mind, I scanned through my notes. Skipping past the initial points that were irrelevant since the hijacking, I honed in on a few words I had emphasized in capital letters. I want you to know, Mike, that my love and respect for you never wavered. My affection for Jasper was simply an additional facet of my life that in no way diminished my feelings for you. It was like an overflow, if you will. As I paused, Mike's attention shifted back to his laptop screen. He furrowed his brow, seeming momentarily confused as he searched for something. His expression briefly shifted from neutral to puzzled before he relaxed again. It was clear he had mistaken something on the screen for what he was looking for. As the recording played on, an extension of the paused soundtrack, I realized his frown had been due to this confusion, not any reaction to my words. I silently wished he hadn't figured it out. Now he would start the clip over. I listened once more to Jasper's question about sharing our marital bed, and once again, I winced at my own response, feeling condemned by my own words. You have to admit, sweetheart, your husband can be quite clueless at times. Remember that incident when he came home early and I had to hide in the closet? What a laugh. Yeah, but he's my clueless guy. When we first started this, I found it endearing how much he trusted me, even when the signs were glaringly obvious. Now though, I see your point, he's just oblivious. Sometimes I wonder if we could have a little fun right under his nose and he wouldn't even notice. The disdain evident in my voice, along with the words themselves, brought a stark realization. I was beating a dead horse. With that tone and those sentiments, I couldn't even convince myself that I still harbored love and respect for my husband, let alone convey it to you. Once again, I found myself engulfed in a whirlwind of confusion. Prior to this conversation, I had convinced myself of my enduring love and respect for Mike. But after my actions and words, how could that still hold true? Tick, tick, tick. In the heavy, oppressive silence following the latest blow to my prospects, Mike turned his gaze towards me. Unable to meet his eyes, I turned instead to his attorney. The disdain etched on her face was so palpable that it made me flinch involuntarily. Any lingering doubts about Mike's significance to her were obliterated by the raw emotion displayed in that expression. I shifted my gaze away from her, only to find myself met with a similar disdain from my own attorney, who failed to conceal it quickly enough. Here I was, entrenched in a battle for my future, surrounded by individuals who regarded me as nothing more than an inconvenience, and one of them was supposed to be advocating for me. My confidence dissipated like mist in the midday sun, followed closely by my sense of self-worth. Perhaps that's why I found myself returning to my notes, stealing myself to take a more assertive stance. It's undeniable, Mike, that over the past six months or so, your attention towards me has dwindled, taking me for granted, frequent business trips, and, dare I say, a growing emotional distance. All of this coincided precisely with the departure of our children, leaving me feeling adrift. You were absent when I needed you most, failing to reassure me when I was at my lowest, leaving me to grapple with feelings of age and unattractiveness on my own. I halted, and Mike's attention swiftly reverted to his incessant screen. Once more, his fingers danced across it, and I couldn't help but cringe.
The document he opened contained a transcript of Jasper's voice, capturing a moment shortly after our unsettling encounter, just before Mike took us out. Apologies, sweetheart, but it's been nearly two weeks since we've been together. Mem, you know how I like it intense. No, seriously, two weeks is too long. Can't we make time to see each other more often? Oh, quit complaining. It's been two weeks for me too, and I have needs as well, especially since you asked me to limit Mike's attention. He had a trip planned last week, but it got cancelled last minute. We could have slipped away somewhere. You're only getting attention tonight because Mike had an urgent meeting to attend. I wish he traveled more often too, darling, believe me. Well, I want more, Jasper insisted, sounding petulant. You'll receive what I decide to give you. Once again, the playback ceased. Feeling ashamed, I cast my gaze downward, avoiding the inevitable accusatory stares. Memories of my emotional state during that conversation flooded back to me. The reality was that the excitement of having a lover, even someone as youthful and lively as Jasper, had begun to fade. Jasper's and my affair, the betrayal of my husband, was eroding my respect for Mike, and that, above all else, was gnawing at my conscience. The loss of respect, I believe, was the primary reason for my growing emotional detachment from my husband. As I prepared for this meeting, intending to confront him about his supposed emotional withdrawal, I realized it was a fatade. In order to justify continuing my betrayal, I had been emotionally divorcing myself from Mike. Rejecting him in bed had been a simple choice because the tenderness of Mike's touch was so distinct from Jasper's impatience that there was no room for confusion. This served as a stark reminder to me that my actions were fundamentally wrong. So, I began to rebuff my husband's advances. He persisted for a while, but then stopped. Suddenly, I grasped what should have been glaringly obvious to me months ago. Mike had abruptly ceased our sexual intimacy around the same time, he started working longer hours and traveling more frequently. Initially, I had interpreted this as his way of emotionally distancing himself from me as well. Now, with closed eyes and a mind clouded with confusion, I struggled to discern who was distancing themselves for whom. And then the realization struck me like a bolt of lightning. Mike must have been aware of my affair for quite some time. That's why he had the foresight to hide a recorder in Kelly's room. Damn it. My entire strategy for this meeting had been centered around downplaying my transgression, soothing Mike's bruised ego and swallowing my pride. All in a desperate attempt to salvage the life and future I yearned for. I had believed I was dealing with a recently provoked bull, attempting to calm his anger. But if my suspicions were correct, and he had known about my infidelity for at least two weeks before confronting me, that he was far more cunning than I had ever imagined. My efforts to appeal to his emotions were futile, and I was wasting my time. Tick, tick, tick. To put it succinctly, I found myself at a loss for what to do. I excel in planning rather than improvising, hence the meticulous two pages of notes I had prepared. Yet time was slipping away, underscored by the relentless ticking of the clock. In a state of desperation, I grasped at my notes, searching for a glimmer of hope. However, the throbbing in my head made it difficult to absorb the words, and nothing immediately stood out. It dawned on me that the notes were now a hindrance, as the dynamics of the situation had shifted dramatically. If Mike had been aware of my infidelity for some time, what were his thoughts? Undoubtedly, he would be hurt by my betrayal, but more importantly, he would be consumed by concerns about my intentions. Was I dissatisfied with the intimacy he provided? Did I find him uninteresting and yearn for something more adventurous? Did I harbor feelings for Jasper? Was I plotting to leave him? These were fears and doubts I could potentially address. With trepidation, I dared to meet his expressionless gaze, contemplating whether to take a risk and spin more lies. If only I could recall the details of my conversation with Jasper on that pivotal night. If only I could be certain that it was the only night Mike had recordings of. Surely the sequence must have been suspicion, setting up recorders, confrontation. He couldn't have been certain for long, he simply wasn't skilled enough as an actor. I yearned desperately to convey the truth, that I still harbored love and respect for him. 
My desperation to prevent him from leaving underscored this, transcending even my fear of losing the comfortable lifestyle we shared. Yet how could I convince him of my respect when we had all heard me disparage him in front of my lover? What value was there in attempting to justify such denigration as a misguided attempt to assuage my conscience and forge a connection with Jasper? None that I could discern. The same dilemma applied to professing my enduring love for him. If I had caught him in the act of infidelity, not even the strongest persuasion could have convinced me of his continued love for me. Thus, convincing him of my enduring love and respect would have to be a gradual process. Time bought by persuading him to refrain from demanding divorce papers was now my most precious commodity. But how many seconds remained on that relentless timer before he made his final decision? One thing was certain, my next words had to carry significant weight. I steeled myself and met Mike's gaze across the table. I understand it may appear that I lost my love and respect for you, Mike, but I want to assure you that this is not the case. My love for you and our life together remains unwavering. I envision spending my days by your side and yours alone. The glimpse of life without you, coupled with the shame I felt when you discovered my betrayal, serves as a constant reminder to stay committed to our relationship for the rest of my days. You can trust in that. Jasper was merely a distraction, a fleeting indulgence when I sought a temporary ego boost. There was no love involved, no intention of ever running away with him. Admittedly, it was a mistake, a grievous one, especially yielding to his absurd suggestion of reducing our intimacy. I can't fathom why I entertained that idea, especially after convincing myself that I was merely compensating for what I perceived as your inadequacies. He didn't offer anything more in the bedroom than you do, despite his youth, and he lacked the finesse and consideration you possess. My actions were purely driven by lust and selfishness, an egoistic escapade. Yes, indulging in physical pleasures until exhaustion was momentarily satisfying, but devoid of any emotional connection. I didn't engage in any of the adventurous activities with him that I've denied you for so long. My voice trailed off as Mike's gaze remained fixed on me, his finger finally pressing the anticipated button. Once again, the room was filled with the sound of my voice, magnified beyond measure. In the recording, my voice echoed with the most explicit desires shared during intimate moments with my partner. They say time dilates in moments of peril, the unraveling of a marriage feels akin to that, as if the world around me moved in slow motion while I remained in real. To my left, my lawyer slammed his pen onto the table, casting me a glance filled with utter revulsion, a stark reminder that even financial compensation couldn't secure someone's loyalty at this juncture. Meanwhile, Mike's attorney shifted to get a better view of the laptop screen. It dawned on me, then that the files Mike had been playing weren't audio recordings as I initially assumed, but rather video clips. The realization heightened my distress. Once again, the woman who had shamelessly clung to my husband's arm displayed her solidarity through physical touch. Mike's response was a blow that cut deeper than any intentional attack could. Though his gaze wasn't directed at me, but at the screen before him, the subtle shift in his expression betrayed the anguish he must have experienced upon discovering that the person entrusted to have his back was instead diverting attention elsewhere. As a solitary tear escaped his eye, I couldn't discern if it was an act of torment or a form of stealing himself for what lay ahead, fixated on the unfolding scenes on the screen. In the dwindling clarity of my thoughts, I grasped onto a few now irrelevant details. The timestamp on the recording indicated it was from a session at least three weeks prior to our confrontation, suggesting that Mike had been silently observing my betrayal for some time, long enough to discern a damning pattern. As my lawyer slid the divorce papers across the table, I found myself unable to summon any defense or justification against the damning evidence my husband, my beloved Mike, had uncovered. With effortless precision, he dismantled every rationalization every attempt to downplay my transgressions, leaving nothing but the stark reality of our irreparable rift. It was over. In this orchestration of our demise, Mike played the role of conductor, directing each movement without uttering a word, utilizing the talents and skills of those around him. Yet, it wasn't Mike who executed me, it was me. I had willingly ascended the scaffold, 
blindfolded myself, tightened the noose around my own neck, and pulled the lever. Mike merely provided the structure and walked away, leaving me to face the consequences of my own actions. The realization hit me like a freight train as he effortlessly triggered that final clip, without a moment's hesitation or even a glance. He knew my every move, my every word, as if he had unfettered access to the inner workings of my mind. I had meticulously constructed my arguments based on decades of intimate observation, forgetting that he too had been observing me for just as long, with those sharp, discerning eyes. The weight of shame and humiliation became suffocating, igniting a primal urge to flee. I craved escape, back to the familiarity of the house that still held remnants of my life, at least until the eviction notice, a cruel part of the settlement, was enforced by Mike. I sought solace in the embrace of my children, hoping they would never uncover the depths of my betrayal and would continue to love me unconditionally. Yet, the path to freedom demanded a heavy price, the relinquishing of most of my life's acquisitions. With a trembling hand, I lifted the pen and affixed my signature to the two agreements, a single fluid motion betraying the turmoil within. I had been taken aback by the valuation of Mike's business, a revelation from my lawyer's assessment. Surely Mike couldn't have concealed such a significant aspect of his assets for long. By that juncture, mercifully, the final recording had concluded, returning the room to a tense silence punctuated only by the ticking of the clock. My lawyer swiftly gathered the signed documents, passing one copy to the woman who had become a bitter symbol of betrayal, before stowing the rest in his briefcase and exiting the room. I remained seated, gripped by a conflicted paralysis, torn between the urge to flee and the desire to depart with a semblance of hope, a flicker of optimism to nurture into something more substantial, a reminder to myself that amidst the wreckage, I still harbored a concern for Mike's well-being. The abrupt blare of the alarm shattered my reverie, propelling me into motion. With resolve, I rose to my feet, determined to leave behind a parting message tinged with positivity, even as the woman, now clinging to Mike's arm with both hands, exuded an aura of predatory satisfaction. Don't jeopardize your future by seeking vengeance against Jasper when he resurfaces, I implored, mustering what remained of my composure. I could never forgive myself if your life took such a dark turn. In response, Mike presented yet another damning clip, mercifully devoid of my voice, but instead featuring the sharp tone of another woman. What has that wretched boy done now? I'll tear him apart if my brothers don't get to him first. His wife, presumably. Initially, I had interpreted Jasper's silence after Mike's altercation as fear. Now, doubts gnawed at my conscience. If Jasper faced the consequence of divorce and destitution for his infidelity, it seemed a fitting punishment. But the prospect of his demise due to his association with me added another weight to my already burdened conscience. As I rose to bid Mike farewell, I found myself unable to meet his gaze. Whether he wore his usual inscrutable mask, laughed, or cried, each expression cut me deep, serving as a painful reminder of the harm I had caused this decent man. He had lost nearly everything I held dear, save for the house and money, and suffered a profound emotional blow, all because of me. I knew I deserved whatever punishment he might mete out. With tear-filled eyes, I managed a feeble goodbye, darling, as I made my way to the door, my feeble attempt to salvage remnants of our past life swiftly dismissed like an insignificant pest. Perhaps my daughter, Laura, would visit while I drowned my sorrows in oblivion. If not her, then maybe my son, Kevin. As I reached for the door handle, voices reached my ears from behind, briefly igniting a flicker of hope that perhaps there was a chance for reconciliation. Yet, it was not the anticipated conversation, but rather another damning recording. A young male voice, thick with emotion, exclaimed, Mom did what? The nerve. Followed by a familiar female voice questioning, Are you certain, Dad? It seemed I would be facing my demons alone tonight, with only the solace of a bottle for company. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.